Hello, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Before we get started, I'm going to invite our executive director, Betty Salker, to come up and say a few words. Thanks, Jessica. I just want to welcome you all here. Um, you know, one of our underlying beliefs here at Literacy Connects is that literacy inequalities at their heart are a social justice issue. Um, and this, but this is the first workshop we've offered that's kind of a deeper dive into some of the roots of that and where that comes from. So um, I'm really proud of our staff who planned this whole event, kind of spearheaded by Jessica, but Sydney and Evie and I'm not sure who else, Susan and Kate. And Kate. Mary. Mary. I mean, yeah, I don't know who the whole team was, but I know they've worked hard. I know they've shared with me. They've learned a lot just in the planning of this. So I'm very excited to be a part of this and see what we all learned this morning. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so real quick, if you were involved with the planning, could you just stand up so everyone can see your lovely faces this morning? <laughs> um, it's really great to see familiar faces on a Saturday morning when El Tour is going on. So thank you so much for being here. Um, so this event, very quickly, before I introduce our speaker, um, this event was really brought on because a lot of us just started on staff started asking questions, um, especially with our current climate, political climate, just asking what is our role at, at Literacy Connects in addressing some of these issues. Um, so I'm really excited because for a lot of us, I feel like this event is the first step in really starting that conversation as a whole. So um, as Betty mentioned that just planning this, we got to ask a lot of great questions, a lot of really difficult questions as well. Um, and so I'm really happy that you're a part of it. You guys are the first volunteers who are going to take this journey with us. Um, and hopefully this isn't the last opportunity that we have, um, but it, so it's just gonna lead to more. Um, very quickly, I'm sorry, some of you don't know me. I'm Jessica Dennis. I work for the Reading Seed Program. And um, as Benny mentioned, I've been spearheading this team, but this team is awesome. You all are in for such a great day. Um, I'm also gonna ask the moderators, if you could stand very briefly, uh, just to wave and say hello. So I'll let the moderators really introduce themselves during discussion groups so that you can get to know who they are. Um, but I just want to thank them very, from the bottom of my heart, they're volunteering their time today just to be here and guide us in these discussions. So what you're going to do today is listen to a keynote speaker. Um, after this, there will be about a 10 minute break and you'll break into discussion groups. So very quickly, uh, I'll just say if you are in group six, you are in <laughs> north one, that's the very first classroom when you first enter the building. Group four, you will be in North 6, that's a computer lab for those of you that are familiar with it. Group 1 is in South 1, just a few doors down from here. Group 5 is in South 3, so this is the big change. If you're in Group 5, you are now in South 3. Um, I think you were told something else when you registered. Group 2 is in South 4, and Group 3 is in South 5, which is the room next here. And this is South 4. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to introduce Dr. Lopez. Um, I will just tell you I got to meet her a few months ago when we started planning this and I was already floored just from one hour of talking to her. So, so Dr. Francesca Lopez, after completing her PhD in educational psychology at the University of Arizona, she served on the faculty of the Educational Policy and Leadership Department at Marquette University. Her research is focused on the ways educational settings promote achievement for Latino youth and has been funded by the American Educational Research Association Grants Program, the Division 15 American Psychological Association Early Career Award, and the National Academy of Education slash Spencer Postdoctoral Fellowship. She is currently working as an associate professor at the University of Arizona. So please welcome Dr. Lopez. My pleasure to be here. Um, so as Jessica mentioned, my background was in educational psychology, um, and that basically means I do research on how students learn. And it's taken me into this journey about biases and the impediments to learning. So 
I'm really excited to share a little bit about how biases form, we all have them, and how knowing about that can help on the, on the trajectory to undoing some of that. So today's outcome, right, is partly, well, what do we do with biases? If we know that they're there, where do we go from there? And I know that since you are going to be in discussion groups, hopefully that will be something that is discussed. Um, but another part is knowing that once we're aware of biases, there's barriers to that because it's against the undertow of a climate. We all live in a society where we receive information. That's where biases come from. So trying to identify what the barriers are um, and what kind of support you might need to help undo some of those biases. So the key thing is, and I saw on the wall, right, some of the things that, that are ground rules for today's experiences. And I like starting with, you know, the idea that if we don't examine our lives and question the things that we've taken for granted, Socrates told us, right, the unexamined life is not worth living. So it's always learning. We can always learn something. And the unchallenged brain is not worth trusting, right? Because we, we are so secure in what we think we know um, that sometimes it's important to challenge what we've accepted as fact. And so I have a very dear friend who posted this on Facebook. And she had, I blocked out the bumper stickers. And just to guess what kind of bumper stickers you might see on a Prius. Any guesses? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so she posted this picture um, and then had a quote underneath that said, a bit of cognitive dissonance to challenge my deep-seated stereotypes, right? Because there's a mismatch between what we would expect to see on a vehicle like this, right? And the bumper stickers that were actually on this vehicle. So this is part of what we all experience, cognitive dissonance, because as human beings, we tend to put people in categories. This is just <coughs> how our brains work. Um, and so there's a book, I encourage you all to reach out and actually get it, it's called Blind Spot. And it's really about the fact that it's not about being bad people, that bad people have biases and act out in very negative ways, but that we all have blind spots as a function of being human beings in a society where we absorb information, right? And so the book really goes through some of the notions of our blind spots. Because again, and I, I will keep stressing this, we all have them, right? We are all, all a function of the society. And so they, the key thing to remember as I go through this today, it's the things that we don't see that are biases. They are not beliefs that we are aware of. They are beliefs that we have that we are unaware that we have. Right? And looking at, well, what are some of the sources of these biases that have led us to believe certain ways, right? So not about, wow, there are some people who are really just bad actors. <coughs> it's good nature, it's a good intent, but how do we introspectively look at what we might believe because of where we are? So one of the reasons we all have biases is that our brains use something um, psychologists <laughs> call top-down processing. And when I found an example of this, I thought it was very fitting since you all work with reading, right, at different levels. Is, is that a fair assumption? Yeah. And I think that if I show you this, <laughs> right, you've all seen something like this, I would assume, right? <coughs> and so if, if you read through it, according to the research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter what order the letters in a word are, the only important thing is that the first and last letter be at the right place. The rest can be a total mess and you can still read it without a problem, right? Wow, the fact our brains can do that. And so top-down processing, so when students are first learning to read, it's important to be able to decode. But it becomes so automatic that we do it without even thinking, right? And top-down processing is that core issue that our brains take information <laughs> so that automatically we can fill it in. So if you think of a time where you've had to drive somewhere for the first time, you probably did not want any distractions. You were highly attuned to how many miles before you're going to make a right, right? That was me this morning. So at point three, right, I take the left on stone. After you've done that drive several times, you can talk on the phone, you can think about other things. Your brain was doing other things, right? Automaticity, our brains do that. 
with everything. It's a function of its effectiveness because it takes a lot of brain power at first. So naturally, every piece of information we're, we're taking in is helping us fill in gaps. And as far as biases go, that means it fills in gaps about people as well, right? It's just what our brains do. So part of the book, The, the Blind Spot, talks about the inclusion paradox, which is we are all human beings, right? We are all alike because we are all human beings. We share the human experience. This is all true, right? I don't think anybody would disagree with this. But paradoxically, right, we are all uniquely different, right? We all have different DNA, patterns in our eyes, and fingerprints, right? And we all have different life experiences, stories, and frame of references in the world. So each of us is very, very unique, but we all share this common lived experience as human beings. Um, but the fact is, we are more like some people than others. <coughs> and when it comes to that, we have an affinity bias. And psychologists have, have helped us see how it is that we categorize people and who we feel more <coughs> comfortable around, right? So we tend to have a preference to be around people who are like us, just the human nature in us. And we all have this deep need to feel included. So part of the reason why we like being around people who are like us is because we feel like we are part of a community and we don't stand out differently, right? We feel at home and that we're understood. So it is this paradox in terms of inclusion. And so we would think that because we all have this need, then the path to being inclusive would be seamless. But we know that that's not true, right? It isn't. We have these obstacles, these biases that stand in the way that, unfortunately, we automatically tend to categorize people as, as other. And I have a very dear colleague and friend who says, you know, pigeonholes are for pigeons. So <laughs> we try to think of not categorizing people, but it's a long road ahead to try to do that. So I wanted to show you a clip. So I'll go into that, and I hope the volume is okay. It's pretty short. Thanks for building. Kayla is a seventh grader at a majority white middle school. Her responses completely change depending on the race of the children in the picture. Marcy and Renee are in school together, and they're in the hallway, and I'd like you to tell me what you think is happening in this picture. She probably looks like she's going to steal it because Marcia's like, oh no, what happened? And he's like, hey, look, 20 bucks. <laughs> and so do you think Renee is doing something good, bad, or um, just neutral? I think she... I don't, I think she's going to take the money. Do you think that Renee and Marcy are likely to be friends or not? Not really. And what do you think about Marcy's parents? Do you think they'd be comfortable with her being friends with Renee or not? Um, well, if they find out the situation that happened, they might be a little concerned about if Renee's a thief. Mm -hmm. And this one we have Erica and Allison, and they're also in the hallway at school. Can you tell me what it seems is happening in this picture? Allison looks like a sweet girl. Mm -hmm. So I think that she would pick up Erica's money and give it back to her. Okay. So then, do you think Allison's doing something good, bad, or neutral? Um, pretty good. And what about Allison and Erica? Do you think they're probably friends or not so much? Yeah, they're probably friends. Okay. Do you think Erica's parents would like it if she was friends with Allison? Yeah. Her responses, according to our expert, Dr. Melanie Killen, could indicate a subconscious racial bias. A bias that kids develop from messages they hear at school, at home, the characters in the TV shows they watch, and what they see online. And Michaela's reversing the scenarios based on race wasn't unique. 24%, almost a quarter of all children, both white and African American, saw their own race more positively than the other race. And this happened across all ages and all school types, no matter the racial demographics. What do you think <coughs> happened in this picture? Um, they got a poster. And what do you think is going to happen next? Brandon's going to help her for this. So do you think that we would be doing something that's okay, not okay, or kind of in the middle? Not okay. Not okay? Is Andre doing something good, bad, or just okay? Good. Michaela's answers were very much in line with her. Yeah. Michaela's parents, Jim and Jennifer, agreed to watch their daughter's test and talk about her responses. Well, if they find out the situation that happened, they might be a little concerned about if Renee's a thief. Mm -hmm. Allison looks like a sweet girl. Mm -hmm. So I think that she would pick up Erica's money and give it back to her. When you see that, what goes through your mind? Is there 
a conversation you want to have with her? Is there stuff you want to know more about? I, I would definitely want to pursue that conversation with her and find out why her perception was different based upon the color of the of the girl's skin. What changed <coughs> in that scenario in her head? It's a teachable moment. It's a you know it's a realization like oh well, maybe we have to do you know a, a better job or uh, focus more on um, distinguishing like. Uh, about racism and, and you know the diversity, and just um, influence our kids and, and let them know that you have to judge a person by their character, not their skin color. <laughs> and it's this possible subconscious racial bias versus explicit bias, actually consciously thinking and verbalizing racism, that our expert says shows how far we need to go, but also how far we've come. Not okay. Explicit racism and prejudice has diminished dramatically over 50 years. But what remains is more the implicit, the implicit biases and uh, the implicit forms of racism and prejudice. And those are the things that we're not aware of, the things that we do and we don't realize it, because it seems that it's these implicit biases that are still what we really have to work on. <laughs> That was quite telling, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what neuropsychologists have found is that it really wasn't that young lady's fault. Is that we are wired in a way that our neural pathways help us have much more empathy and be able to relate to those who we categorize as ourselves. And there is more of a dissonance when someone is very different. This is one of the reasons why <coughs> scholars who have looked at the resegregation of schools are so worried, is that the more kids and families are leaving and creating these hyper-segregated situations, I mean, we are more segregated now than we were many, many years ago. And that creates fear because when children don't see other children, the, the contact hypothesis is, they, it's that much easier to other children because they don't understand and they don't have friends that aren't necessarily like them. So it's a huge concern for many, many reasons. So what this neural pathway does is it causes us to have automatically more empathy. We can visualize ourselves with a person who shares that background and we really can't do that as easily with somebody who might be different from us, right? And so the members of the out group tend to be different. The, plus side to this is if we're aware of this there are things we can do to undo some of the neural pathways which i'll get to toward the end so when we think of biases right we're often thinking about the beliefs we have toward members of a group that is unlike our own that really is but if you if you heard what they said on the cnn clip is that even children of color the african-american kids were also part of this and this is because they too are receiving messages from society that devalue and I'll give some examples toward the end as well so what are these biases and, and why should we care right they are beliefs based on stereotypes if I were to package it in, in a small definition they are stereotypes gone wild right that, that are unchallenged and the issue with stereotypes is that our brains build and solidify them with something called confirmation bias. So I'm gonna use an example that I tend to use because we are all aware of stereotypes. And so if I were to ask <coughs> you, what is the stereotypical gender of somebody who is not a good driver? Women, right? So how would confirmation bias work, right? Confirmation bias would work if we're driving along we're ignoring the gentlemen, maybe they're not so much gentlemen, who cut us off, right? Who don't put a turn signal on. But the moment we notice that it's a female doing that, well, of course, it's a woman driver, right? This is how confirmation bias works. We pay attention to the things that fit into the categories in our brain, and it just serves as the example of all the things that we've seen in our life, and we ignore all the rest. This is just how our brains work. So confirmation bias is one of these things that leads us to believe it's true. I've seen it. I've experienced it, right? And so that is the lens then that we use. It's this um, self-fulfilling prophecy because it's that lens that we use to evaluate who the good drivers are and the not so good drivers, right? So these biases inform the behaviors 
right? The assumptions that we make and who should be driving. And they promote, and this is key because we, we all fall victim to this, is this language of lacking, <coughs> what we tend to call deficits, um, limitations in the students rather than our own limitations. And this is something I've seen in my own research. And so to kind of get at what I'm talking about with these biases, there was a, a group of researchers at Yale who wanted to look at biases in preschool teachers. We're talking, you know, very young children, toddlers, ages three to four, right before they go into kindergarten. So they went to a preschool conference and they recruited 135 preschool teachers who had to look at a video and they were asked, we want you to see if you can gauge when there's going to be challenging behavior. Because classroom management with little ones can be a big <coughs> deal, right, if they're running around all over the place. They were hooked up to monitors that tracked their eyes. Where do you think their gaze went? To the African-American children, and most often to the African-American boy. And the kicker was that there was no challenging behavior. So this was, not that they were evil people, they were teachers who wanted to make a difference and work with very young children, but the biases they had led them to be looking in a place where society has told us, this is likely where you're going to find the challenging behavior, even when it's not there. So we're talking about the things that we carry with us that affect how we judge people, how we relate to people, and the kind of behaviors we might enact in classrooms. But the academy, I'm part of is also to blame. So there was a study done not that long ago where a bunch of scholars at USC were looking at vocabulary differences between white toddlers and Mexican American toddlers. And PR picked up the story. And this is the image that they put on the transcript online. They, they took it down immediately because it got such a backlash. What the researchers were looking at was English vocabulary. But what this image showed was well, the d reason there's this achievement gap in vocabulary between Mexican-American toddlers and white toddlers <laughs> is that white mothers talk to their children and Latina mothers do not, right? And the issue is, is that at glancing at this, if we have this bias, and again, that we are unaware of, it is going to solidify the, the assumption that the reason we see these achievement disparities is because some parents just don't care, they're not doing the things that they should be doing, and I can tell you, I thought of this image, I was recently in Santa Barbara for a policy meeting, and there were, were a group of Mexican grandparents, and they had a little toddler. They spoke to that child the entire time. Look at the airplane, do you see the airplane? Do you see the bigger one? I mean, they engaged in speech. So there are so many examples that counter this, but when people aren't around people who are unlike them, well, this must be true, and PR published it, right? So we get this information from all sorts of sources. Um, and in my own research, I asked teachers, what do you believe will increase achievement and what obstacles do you believe impede achievement? So I get answers like this. When students have parents who work the night shift and they don't spend enough time with their kids, it is a huge obstacle. Or a fourth grade teacher, I believe educating parents would help increase achievement. When parents value and make education a priority, so do the children. Parents need to understand the importance of school, why their child should be there, and be involved in the child's education. Or a fifth grade teacher, it seems parents want teachers to do all the academic work in school and seldom help with homework. Most kids don't even have chores anymore. So these answers fall in line with what we would call deficit perspectives. This assumption that because parents aren't doing the things that teachers expect, well, they must not care. But we have so much research showing us that parents of color absolutely care. They want a better life for their children. But sometimes there is a language obstacle. Sometimes they are working two, three jobs, and they can't be present in the school. So they are working so much harder than other parents, and yet it seems like, well, they don't value education. There are numerous reasons, right, why we might not see parents engaging in behaviors that we would expect, but the assumption tends to be for many of these teachers, that falls in line with my bias. They're not conscious of this, of course, right? So obviously these parents don't care. What if we educate them and tell them how important education is? They do know education is important. And I have never interviewed a parent 
that hasn't talked about the sacrifice and how they want more for their children than they have, right? So there's definitely a dissonance here. Now, sometimes, though, I have teachers who answer like this. We need to validate language learners by promoting reading and writing in their first language. Um, I need more bilingual material in my classroom. We need more opportunities to connect with family. Or a fourth grade teacher, we need a curriculum that understands our students' culture. Students are often not stimulated in school because teachers may not know a student's background or interests and fail to incorporate those into lessons. Or a fifth grade teacher, I think we need to incorporate leaders, culture, and themes in the classroom that resemble our students, especially dealing with local Tucson history. Do you notice the huge divide in, in the belief of what the obstacle is? If I were to categorize the first one, it's blaming the students, blaming the parents. And the other one, it's we need to fix the school. We need to make it relevant to the kids and the families we serve. And that's the first step in seeing them as assets. They all have strengths. How do we incorporate those right into the curriculum so our students see themselves in it? right? So these biases allow us to default to these deficit views, the less than, what they're <coughs> lacking, what they don't have. And these things tend to play out in how we behave, right, in classrooms. So much so, so as a member of the American Psychological Association, this was a magazine cover, right, part of the magazine that I, I get every month from the American Psychological Association. And in this issue, it was all about biases. And so in, in the cover, it says, the boy would be three times more, more likely to be placed in a gifted education program if he had a black rather than a white teacher. What is behind the racial disparity in our education system? So these disparities cut across gifted, AP, advanced placement classes, the kind of school students go to, not again on purpose, but as part of how biases are functioning that just perpetuate what we tend to see, right, in society. So biases allow us to default to deficit views of family and youth. They play out in behaviors. And so what I wanted to kind of walk through is this study done several years ago by a sociologist at UCLA by the name of Jeannie Oakes. And she called the book Keeping Track. And in one of the early chapters, she says, look, this book is not about race, but it just so happened that when I was looking at high track schools and low track schools, they were divided by socioeconomic status, and they were divided by race and ethnicity. So it just so happened that the high track, high achieving <coughs> schools had very few students of color, very few students in poverty, and the low track schools had a huge number of students in poverty and a huge number of students of color, right? It's just the way society has stratified. But that was not her intent. She was really <coughs> focusing on how do we track students, so tracking them into high and low, and what does that do for their possibilities, for their possible futures? So in chapter four of this book, she interviewed teachers, <coughs> and she asked teachers in the high group and the low group this key question. What are the five most critical things you want your students to learn in your class? If you were a success, what will they walk out knowing, right? And so I, have, I won't read all of them. I'm going to highlight some words that came out in the answers that the teachers gave. They said things like, for the high track, I want them to be able to interpret, to identify, to think, to reason, to, to know the art of research, to test and prove ideas, scientific reasoning, investigating, um, thinking critically, interpretation, logical thought processes, analysis, Love and respect for math, right? So those of you right, who know Bloom's taxonomy, those are all high-level skills. That is what we want kids to do because that's what they will be doing in college, hopefully, right? Is thinking and analyzing and, and using the scientific method. <laughs> but in the low track, this is the answers that the teachers, that they felt they were successful if students had at the end. Independence, responsibility of working with people, understanding basic words, working with other students, able to follow directions, respecting my position, responsibility, right? Um, I have this as a partner activity, but just in the interest of time, what do you notice very dramatically across those two settings, that the, goal, the goals that the teachers have? Yeah. 
It is, right? Would anybody disagree? We're, we're talking a very, very low bar. And this was how they would feel successful, right? So I think it's also very important to hear what the students have to say because it, it kind of guides us on really what needs to be done. So she asked students in the high track and the low track, what is the most important thing you've learned in school this year? So for the high track students, things like doing experiments, the basis of our economic system, the economy, business, right? And in the low track, it was answers like getting a job, getting a job, preparation for the above, getting a job, or worse, nothing, nothing, <coughs> nothing. I don't remember. This class is a big waste of time and effort. I learned that English is boring. And this one is key because I think he so eloquently really gives us the, the issue. I've learned just a small amount in this class. I feel that if I was in another class, that I would have a challenge to look forward to each and every time I entered the class. I feel that if I had another teacher, I would work better, oh my right? So it matters. And students know if the expectations are low. We've all heard of the self-fulfilling prophecy. And yet these tracks solidify. In fact, we know through research that first grade reading achievement is such a strong predictor. We know what students will drop out of school by first grade. I mean, and part of it is the structure in school. So it's a huge problem. Because as I'll show you, our achievement has really not changed with decades of education reform, right? So. We know that children who belong to these stigmatized groups, the groups that are vulnerable to stereotypes because of poverty, because of race or ethnicity, or because of a disability, right? The issue is that children who belong to these groups become <coughs> susceptible to stereotypes because they become aware of them. So your average child becomes aware of stereotypes by the age of 10. But if you, the child is a member of the stereotype group by <coughs> kindergarten, they are aware of those stereotypes. And becoming aware of it makes you susceptible to its effects, which means you are much more vulnerable to the low expectation, self-fulfilling prophecy that we tend to see in, in schools. And we see this from Jane Elliott's experiment after Martin Luther King's assassination. How many of you remember Jane Elliott? She did the experiment with the brown eyes, blue eyes. <coughs> sound familiar? Yes. To some, is there anybody that this doesn't sound familiar to? OK. I'll. I'll so this is a teacher in Iowa. And there's actually, if you go into PBS Frontline, there's the entire documentary that has footage of what she did with these third graders in Iowa and what they thought about it years later in the 80s when they were adults. And so what she describes in this, in this study is that she said, I didn't think that my class of students who have never seen students unlike themselves could really understand prejudice. Martin Luther King had just been assassinated, so she devised this experiment <coughs> where on the first day she told students who had blue eyes that they were superior and flipped it the next day where the brown eyed students were told that they were superior. And what unfolded, it is very powerful. I've never been able to watch it without breaking down in tears because you see kids who were friends start to other each other. And they can't drink at the water fountain because they have brown eyes and I'm not playing with them and they start to name call. And there's a little boy that breaks down and the teacher says, well, what, what did he call you? He called me brown eyes. So how a name became this negative connotation. But the image I have up on the screen showed something very, very powerful. On the day that the students were inferior, they were doing some flashcards that they did every single day for reading. It was a phonics exercise. And on the day that the students were wearing the collars, they had to wear collars on the day that they were the less group, they had the slowest reaction time. The day that it flipped, they beat the class record for how quickly they went through. And this is, this is something that you read in a book by Claude Steele. He's a social psychologist at Berkeley and Stanford. He's gone back and forth. Um, where he, it's called Whistling Vivaldi, and they have it on audiobook. But he mentions her because he says, that is how powerful eliciting a stereotype. This stereotype wasn't true, that brown eyes or blue eyes were better. But just telling the students that made them overperform or underperform that quickly, right? So if we think of stereotypes and how they are all around us, 
when we see achievement disparities, it really should be no surprise, right? That we see this, this disparity based on stereotypes. So very briefly, well, how does that happen, right? Why would a stereotype do that? And what we know is that it takes up space in our working memory. Our working memory is where we think and process. It's the reason why phone numbers are seven digits, right? It's about the n number of digits that our brain can hold. Of course, some people can hold more, but that's the average amount. So we know it takes up space, and when it takes up space, we can't think as well. And when we can't think as well, our performance is sabotaged. So there are videos um, available there that I think is, I'll, I'll share it so that you can see it, where they did it at the University of Arizona and actually did the experiment to show that no matter what, so this work, very briefly, has been done with every stereotype imaginable. <coughs> every single one, and it works out every single time. That's how powerful stereotypes are. So when we look at something like this, this is the National Assessment of Educational Progress. It's been around since 1969. It's administered in every state, and it's what informs our nation's report card. It also informs our state's report card, right, to compare across states. It's the only assessment that the government gives every couple of years in math, reading, writing, civics, they have others, science. Um, but this one is fourth grade reading. And if we look at data from 1992 all the way to 2015, we've had no child left behind between there, right? And now we have ESSA. Do we really see any change in these gaps? And I know this is illegible, but I don't think any of us really needs to read this to know who is here and who's above. These gaps are stubborn. They have not changed. It does not matter what education reform we've seen. Um, if I were to show you math, we do see an upward trend. So it's helped everybody kind of move up a little bit in terms of mathematics in fourth grade, but it has not closed those achievement disparities. So it can help improve to some extent, but it doesn't eliminate. This is eighth grade reading. So it's given in fourth grade, eighth grade, and twelfth grade. Here's eighth grade math. Again, you kind of see this upward trend, still have the gaps. So that's an issue, right? We have education reform. We have better standards. Why can't we eliminate these disparities? So our brains will do this, as I mentioned already. It'll soak up information and make snap decisions with everything around us. And it is not conscious awareness. I really want to drive that home. It is not about us being bad people. It is just a function of the things we see all around us at the checkout counter. And I have lots of examples to show you about that. Um, but I saw this beautiful clip that I wanted to share. It's actually a 20 minute TED talk. But what I'm about to show you is only about three or four minutes um, because it's just such a powerful narrative of the single story is, is how she refers to it. <coughs> I come from a conventional middle-class Nigerian family. My father was a professor. My mother was an administrator. And so we had, as was the norm, living domestic help who would often come from nearby rural villages. So the year I turned eight, we got a new house boy. His name was Fide. The only thing my mother told us about him was that his family was very poor. My mother sent yams and rice and our old clothes to his family. And when I didn't finish my dinner, my mother would say, finish your food. Don't you know people like Fide's family have nothing? So I felt enormous pity for Fide's family. Then one Saturday, we went to his village to visit. And his mother showed us a beautifully patterned basket made of dyed raffia that his brother had made. I was startled. It had not occurred to me that anybody in his family could actually make something. All I had heard about them was how poor they were, so that it had become impossible for me to see them as anything else but poor. Their poverty was my single story of them. Years later, I thought about this when I left Nigeria to go to university in the United States. I was 19. My American roommate was shocked by me. She asked, where I had learned to speak English so well, and was confused when I said that Nigeria happened to have English as its official language. She asked if she could listen to what she called my tribal music, and was consequently very disappointed when I produced my tape of Mariah Carey. <laughs> <laughs> she 
She assumed that I did not know how to use a stove. What struck me was this. She had felt sorry for me even before she saw me. Her default position toward me as an African was a kind of patronizing, well-meaning pity. My roommate had a single story of Africa, a single story of catastrophe. In this single story, there was no possibility of Africans being similar to her in any way, no possibility of feelings more complex than pity, no possibility of a connection as human equals. I must say that before I went to the US, I didn't consciously identify as African. But in the US, whenever Africa came up, people turned to me, never mind that I knew nothing about places like Namibia. But I did come to embrace this new identity, and in many ways I think of myself now as African, although I still get quite irritable when Africa is referred to as a country, the most recent example being my otherwise wonderful flight from Lagos two days ago in which um, there was an announcement on the Virgin flight about their charity work in <coughs> India, Africa and other countries. <laughs> so after I had spent some years in the US as an African, I began to understand my roommate's response to me. If I had not grown up in Nigeria, and if all I knew about Africa were from popular images, I too would think that Africa was a place of beautiful landscapes, beautiful animals, and incomprehensible people fighting senseless wars, dying of poverty and AIDS, unable to speak for themselves, and waiting to be saved by a kind white foreigner. I would see Africans in the same way that I, as a child, had seen Fide's family. The, it, it really is worthwhile to watch the entire um, TED Talk. It, it's, and I was very proud of the fact that my 18-year-old uh, son was the one who came home and said, Mom, Mom, you've got to see this. It was, I was very proud. Um, so where do we get this information? And part, she put, talked about a little bit about images. And this is all around us. This is an example of a movie, Dangerous Minds, it might sound familiar to some of you, where they cast Michelle Pfeiffer as the savior of an urban, right? So already we start to see this in, in film. <coughs> but the kicker was that this is based on a true story, but the teacher was Latina. But they just happened to cast, and this happens a lot. I have many examples of, of how this happens. The Ron Clark story is another example where we see a person coming in of a he's white and come in to save an urban group. Freedom Riders is yet another example. Um, so what we see in our US film <coughs> industry is that we tend to see white characters being cast even when they're supposed to play other characters. She is supposed to be Pacific Islander, Islander Chinese and they cast a white woman instead. Um, which one did I skip? He is supposed to be a Japanese <laughs> character, Prince of Persia. We have another white gentleman. And what we also see, and this is important because these are films that kids go to see. And in this film, Airbender, all of the good characters were very light-skinned. And all of the villains were dark-skinned. So kids are seeing this and internalizing. So when we saw that CNN clip about who the, the young lady thought was good or bad, this is part of the situation where she has just absorbed the information that the media has really given us. Um, ben Affleck is another one who's played a person of color, a Latino. But we also see this in ads. So, I, and I had an old example of a 1950s ad that was very derogatory toward women. It was a Heinz ketchup bottle, and it said something like, it's so easy, even a woman can open it. Um, and there were lots of examples like that. And when I show that image, I say, you know, we, we hope we've come a long way and we don't see that kind of stuff. There are scholars who actually focus on the way women are portrayed, people of color are portrayed. This is a recent image. Re-civilize yourself. And on face value, it's like, okay, Nivea, you know. Okay. But it's portraying that the natural hair of an African American is uncivilized. I mean, that is the implicit assumption here that is promulgated. And we see this with gender. I mean, it's not just race and ethnicity. It's what little girls should be doing and little boys should be doing. I challenge you to walk through Target and take a look at the different aisles. They are very, very gendered. And take a look at the dolls. Who sees themselves in the dolls and who does not, right? So we, we see this all over the place. 
And even in schools, and I have an elementary age daughter, we still see this where we do not learn the true story about Native American populations. Mm -hmm. And so this is the kind of stuff we learned that it was lovely and <laughs> that they should even come in and dress up um, as Indians and, and pilgrims. So we see these activities. And yet, then we're shocked when someone like The Gap comes out with a t-shirt that says Manifest Destiny and doesn't understand why Native American populations were furious. And there was a huge backlash about this is what Manifest Destiny looked like to us. Why would you minimize it? And where the College of Education is at the University <coughs> of Arizona, it's right in front of sorority and fraternity row. And every year it has not failed to happen since I've been there. There is some issue with a student dressing up uh, with a Mexican sombrero and just insulting other cultures and not understanding what the big deal is, right? So part of the issue of this disconnect between <coughs> our youth not understanding what the big deal is and marginalized communities being upset is that they're not taught the true story in school. So when they're not taught that true story, they really are bewildered at why are people so upset about this, right? And it becomes a responsibility, at least I felt it when I've taught undergraduate populations about this is what really happened. And I can't believe that to this day I still have students in my class who will tell me I never learned that in school, not even in high school. So we have a responsibility to know that it isn't their fault. There's, our system is broken in some ways. It does not teach them the true story. And so it's a learning experience for all of us, right? Um, so what do we do to undo some of this? And the very first, and I'd say the most important thing that we can do is that we have to be open and willing to know, all right, I have biases. I, I have them. I myself, I'm very fair-skinned, as you can see, but I am Latina. And it wasn't until I started learning about this that it really struck me when I would go to look for dolls that were Mexican-American that there weren't any for my daughter, right? Or when I went to go look at Band-Aids and realized, wow, the flesh tone, right, is light. And that, that's all there is. Of course, you've got the cute ones, and those are the ones I used with my kids. But there's still this overwhelming issue of what is considered normal and dominant and then everything else being marginalized or different. So being aware that we all have these biases and then challenging them. How do we challenge the biases that we've absorbed? And we do have answers. That is the, the wonderful part of it, is that we actually have a way to undo the damage that we've seen. So one of the things is, I know you all know this, that we tell parents, read to your child. It is one of the most important things you can do as a parent. Share the books look at them with them, look at the images, go to the library. But what we may not be aware of is <coughs> our most in-need families don't see themselves in the books when they go to the libraries or the bookstores. So this is an example that we have 61% of the U.S. population is white, but of picture books, they represent 90, almost 90% 90 of the images in picture books. And when we look at what we see in Tucson, right, with our large demographic of Latino populations, which is much more than 18%, they are only in about less than 2% of the books. Our African-American students, less, the, uh, less than 4%, close to 3% of books, they're not even seeing themselves in the examples in literature before they step into school. Never mind TV and, and all those other things. So this is the image of John Glenn, right? And we all learned about John Glenn. But I, for one, was shocked when the movie Hidden Figures came out because I had never heard of Katherine Johnson, right. ever. Did, has everybody seen that film? No. Okay, if you have not, I highly encourage you. But I heard a lot of people say, why had we not learned about her? Why didn't we know that it was a woman and it was an African-American woman who helped get him up there, right? The image, the possibilities, and the clip I showed you of that TED talk, she talks about the fact that when she would write, she's an author, she's a very well-known author, that she would write about characters she read about. None of them looked like her because that's all that she knew and how critical it is for our children to see themselves <coughs> not only in the negative examples of history to know our history, 
but of all the positive examples that for some reason have never been made explicit, right? So this is one way that we know through research is the best way to undo biases. It takes effort, but finding exemplars of our students who don't tend to be seen in the curriculum to show them <laughs> there are examples of success in your history. There are examples of math whizzes, of scholars, of writers that you might not see in schools because our curriculum doesn't tend to seek those out, right? So one key way of undoing biases is to really start looking at the counter narratives. And we have so few films like this that it's really important that we see more films like Hidden Figures and challenge films, right, that portray certain groups as in need of salvation instead of enabled to be empowered in, in their own self, not salvation, but in, in terms of their upward mobility. So, yes, Catherine Johnson. <coughs> so, with today, right, hopefully you've gathered some knowledge about biases as, as a first step. And I will say that when I started doing this work, um, I still learn every day. It's one of those things that once you see it, you can't unsee it. And even when I've been in like a Pilates class, I will be doing a stretch and I'll think about something like, oh my gosh, I never even thought of that. It's, it's a wonderful thing that kind of opened up my eyes to now see things that I never saw before in commercials, in film, in books, in families, in students. I guarantee that had I not been doing this work, I wouldn't have thought twice about the grandparents behind me engaged in talk with their granddaughter for a two hour flight the entire time. But I was paying attention because it was a counter narrative to the kind of things that we see, right? Something I would have ignored before. And so what do we now do, right? Part of it is action. Part of it is being aware of these things. Um, so what I'm hoping, and we, we still have a little bit of time, so I'm thrilled to entertain any questions before we wrap up, but knowing who your students are, right? Who are they really? Getting to know them a little bit deeper. Um, and what are some potential biases that may play out at our site? So as a former teacher, I can tell you that I, I was a teacher before I had children of my own. And the students who were about eight years old, they wanted to know about me. But it was their hook so that I would get to know about them. So they would ask me things like, Miss, do you have any kids? Miss, what do you do with this? Um, and it was really their way of wanting to tell me about what they did on weekends, what their families did, what they loved. And children will want to share that because they want to know somebody cares about them. And one of the things that is in, in this presentation, there's a book. I'm just throwing out all these excellent books to you. Um, it's by Angela Valenzuela, and it's called Subtractive Schooling. And here she documents the stories of children who were successful versus those that were not. And the narrative, those that were not successful said, nobody cared about me. The teachers did not care. And those that were, they did care. Connection, belonging, valuing, right, of human beings and who they were. So I know you're all here, you're volunteers, it is clear you care, right? And students will know that because you're doing something that many people will not do. But getting to know them a little bit deeper sometimes is that key to forming that relationship that helps you learn from each other, right? That can be very, very powerful. So, and then how do you address this? Um, and this, I think, is more for Literacy Connects. I think how they can help with the barriers you, you face to implement this um, and what support you might need in workshops, in groups, in discussions. What do you need to be able to be successful? It isn't just about, okay, you got a keynote speech in a, in a workshop. What do you really need to make this work, right? And so I'll stop there, Excellent. but I would love to entertain any questions you might have. Yeah. <coughs> Back to the um, Jean, I think you called who had that experiment, the blue eyes, the yes. brown eyes. Yes. This might be a little off point, but it had manifested such dramatic um, self-image of these students. What, what was done, if anything, to rectify that? In other words, to bring them back to center? Or <laughs> oh, after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I, you know, that's, that is not something we could do now. 
right? We, we, um, when I've shown this to students, I tell them the Institutional Review Board at the University of Arizona will not allow you to conduct a research oh, yeah. study like, like this. Yeah, it's, it's so traumatic. But what's interesting is that when you hear the adult say, would you want to do it again? They all say yes. They all say yes. It's traumatic, but there was a debriefing. And the way she debriefed, and again, it's accessible to all of you to see um, on Frontline. It's called Eye of the Storm, I think. Oh, no, A Class Divided. It's called A Class Divided. Um, what she told them was really trying to elicit, didn't that feel horrible? It's like, yes, do we ever want to treat other people like that? No. I mean, these were eight-year-olds. And so she tried to do it in their language um, so that they would be able to understand. And they were primed early on <laughs> with doing this experiment. You know, so they did have that buffer. Would I want my own child to go through that? No. I mean, it, it's really dramatic. And from my own opinion, she still does these workshops, and she's very in your face with adults. I don't agree with that approach just because I think that if we truly want to have people understand that people have assets, then we don't treat them like they have deficits. We don't treat them like, well, you're just racist and you don't know what you're doing. That I think it's very important to understand we're all in this together, right? We are all part of a society that has helped distribute this kind of stuff and we all have assets and most of us want to change. So. It is traumatic, um, and it was done in the 60s. So we couldn't do that now. It just reminds me of the guy that did the experiment with the punishment. The prison one or the other one, the one with the shock? The shock. The shock one. Stanford did all these horrible experiments. <laughs> um, the shock one was they weren't really being shocked, for those of you who might not know, but it was friends, and they would put in so much, it was horrible. Um, and then there was a prison experiment that Zimbardo did at Stanford, where friends were then categorized into prisoners and wardens, and friends would start behaving in horrible ways that we actually see in actual real life w with these power differentials. So a very powerful lesson, but at what cost, right? Because we do see this play out naturally. Um, yes. So it's worth watching. I would not encourage anybody to do it. Yeah. At all. At all. Anything else? Yes. You know, I work with Native Americans. Okay. Um, and um, I found that because of the history yes. of uh, forced education, um, where, where kids were removed from villages, taken to yes. schools to become white, yeah. basically, yeah. Uh, weren't allowed to practice any of their culture. Right had to dress like white people, were punished severely if they didn't. S many of them died. Yeah. Um, Native Americans still, at least the ones I worked with, still have a suspicion, you know, a distrust of the educational system. Because yeah. some of them, their grandparents were in those schools. In the boarding schools, yeah. Yes, yeah. in the boarding schools. And that's a very difficult barrier to overcome, especially if the school isn't a Native American school. That's right. And there really aren't very many. <coughs> and unfortunately, there aren't very many Native American teachers, right? We, we don't see examples that would at least reflect the culture. Right. And one of the most important things because of the trauma Right, that, that our Native American families experienced in the United States with, I mean, children being ripped from their, from their homes. It's, it's truly traumatic. Um, it's so important to demonstrate, and this is not immediate, but to build trust, there needs to be action on our part that we are interested and we will honor their culture. And so one of the things that, that can be done is bringing in tribal members, forming those relationships with tribal communities where they come in and share. Because <coughs> if it becomes a space where their background is honored, then the trust starts to build. Because if we leave it alone the way it is now, it's just more of the same. It's, this is our curriculum. You have to fit in. It's something we see at the college level. 
they make up only 1% of students who make it there because they're being forced. And there's a very recent example, the eclipse. It was the very first day of school at the university. And the day of the eclipse for Navajo students is a sacred day where they're supposed to be fasting and praying and not going outside. And so our, our college students had to make a decision, do I miss the first day of class? Or do I den and deny my culture? Or do I say, forget it, I'm not gonna go to class when this is their, it's a very delicate situation, right? Where, in my opinion, they shouldn't have to be making those choices. People should know about this in the college to work with them, right? So what you just raised is critical. If, if everybody knew about this and everybody <coughs> was willing to engage families, to make sure that what they honor is respected in the schools, then building that trust is that much easier, right? Because there are Native American authors. There are, and, and to treat all Native Americans is the same as another slippery slope because there's different tribes and there's different histories, right? But knowing that and validating that, I think helps build trust, um, particularly in a context where they, you know, again, in the college level, success is defined very differently. For many um, Native Americans, it's being able to go back into their communities and give, which is very different from the upward mobility that is honored at the college level, which is you're gonna make it, and you're gonna make it on your own and show what your worth is when they're much more collective. That's very generalizing, but that can, tends to be one of the tensions. That's true. Yeah, so, I mean, what you raise is a critical issue. We also have a very deep history with Mexican-American students. And this having been part of Mexico and the Treaty of Guadalupe and how it was not honored and that legacy with our African American students, there is also a legacy, right? So there are things that I think that if we made sure people knew about in the schools, it would be that much easier to build connections right. to see people with their assets. So I'm glad you raised that. Because that's an important very few people, very few white people know about that. Very few. And it's our education system's fault. About the, about the, yeah. the, the uh, schools. That's right. Um, and, and how horrible they were. Abs no, you're absolutely right. When I showed a clip of the boarding schools, my students had not heard about it before, ever. So it, it's something that we need to fix in, in the K-12. Yes, sir. What do you make of this sea of very light faces? Which would, if we got all of our volunteers together, you would find that there were little dots of color yeah. around. But for the most part, this is what you see. This is who we train. Yes. And what would I make of that? And, well, <laughs> is, there, is there something that we can do differently that would encourage a more diverse uh, community of volunteers. Yeah, okay. So this is what's interesting, that if you look at the U.S. demographics and even look into our Tucson demographics of teachers, it's pretty much the same as what we have in this room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Except there are many more men in here than our demographics nationally and locally for teachers. It's about 90% white women that, that tend to be teachers. And at the college level for preparation of teachers, the conversation is, how do we get more Mexican-American, African-American, Native American individuals to go through that process to become teachers? And so I mean, it's, it's all these things that need to be rectified. How do I see myself as something when I haven't really seen an example of it? But I think that building bridges with community members, and I would urge you even with the university, to find people who could connect you to people, right? to increase the diversity because there are professionals out there who would do it but might not even know about this opportunity to diversify. And that's a key, key issue because it isn't that we do not want you all in here. It's critical, but it's also wonderful. There, there's a scholar at Harvard by the name of Lisa Delpit and she often talks about diversifying the teaching population and she's often asked, so do you think African-American kids should only have African-American teachers? And she says, no. They should have some, right? Mm -hmm. They should be able to see themselves in some of the teachers to know that that's a possibility. And the same goes for people who come in to volunteer. There are professionals of all various backgrounds in our city. It's just a matter of connecting them maybe with Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and like other, other entities 
they can help diversify, which I think goes a lot further than, I mean, it takes a village. It really <coughs> does. So I'm, that's a wonderful question. I was really struck with the, um, the low track and the high track yeah. students and the, the teacher goals that, um, you know, we mentioned the bar being low, but the big difference I noticed was independent thinking versus falling in line. Yes. Um, and, and being independent versus being ready for a job. Yep. And uh, just thinking about how much our, our economy uh, essentially demands yes. that pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, of cheap labor mm -hmm. and, yes. and how early that, that starts. So you have just described, there's an image, and it's it's from 1969 in, in an article, and so it's very hard to see, so I stopped using it. But there's many sociologists, some of them by the name of Bowles and Gintis, that talk about schools are just churning out what we see in society. And that really, when we look at those low tracks, the idea that students who are in low tracks will somehow magically make it, like we're gonna give them remediation. It's absurd to think they're ever gonna get into the high tracks because look at what the kids in the high tracks are learning and what they're learning. So when we see that, it's no you know, surprise when we continue to see those achievement disparities. And why in the getting a job and the low, low skill, right, at, at least educationally, why we tend to see racial economic divides with that as well. Because schools are just preparing, right, for the things that we tend to see in society. But there was a hand back here and then, and then. Yeah, and um, actually, um, when you first put the slide off, I was gonna say something and then, but um, about the low track, high track. <clears throat> in defense of the low track, I mean, I taught at a high school with at-risk students for, <clears throat> I'm sorry, 10 years. And I have to say that before you could possibly get them to do the high track stuff, and believe me, that's how I was trained, the high track stuff, and I desperately wanted them to get there. Yeah. <clears throat> they needed a lot of those things that were in the low track. So, you know, 10 years I did this. So it wasn't bias. It, it was my actual experience with these kids. So well, I'm going to push back on that just a little bit because you were at the high school level. And some of these were high schools and some of these were junior highs. Right. But the reason they came to you like that is a legacy <coughs> of assumptions and biases, well, that's right? True. Yeah, and that's so, true. It, you know, to expect that somehow at the high school level you're magically going to make up for eight, nine, ten years of education, that's true. right? It's the whole idea that those tracks that we see are <laughs> so impermeable. So I'm glad you raised it, because the idea that we would somehow fix it magically, it's difficult. There are a lot of obstacles, <coughs> but it is a legacy, and it's entrenched so that those kind of things just continue. Well, I, know, I used to think about that a lot, because they were high school, you know, and I can't even imagine how many terrible school experiences exactly. they had before they got to me. It, and, and I'll say that when we look at schools, they are hyper-segregated, and our students of color, students in poverty, tend to go to the lowest schools where there's a lot of teacher turnover. So there are a lot of obstacles that they have just in their schooling experiences that, that promote that as well. Yeah. One more? Okay. I just wanted to comment that um, one of the obstacles that I see is we have entrenched powerful interests that want to keep things this yes. way mm -hmm. in our country. Yes. Mm -hmm. Powerful interest. Even more now. More now. Yeah. It's increasing. It's getting to work. It is. And we've got to pay attention <coughs> to where these powerful interests are coming from and what their goals are. They're pretty scary. They're scary, and I, would, I know I, I can send this list of books. Um, this actually go, goes all the way to the Goldwater Institute. Um, where there's a, a legal scholar by the name of Ian Haney Lopez at Berkeley who wrote a book called Dog Whistle Politics, mm -hmm. and he traces the kind of language that has mass appeal, stroked people's fears and beliefs and biases, and led them to vote the way we've seen people voting that have now put us in a situation where we have someone who knows nothing about education yeah. as our secretary mm -hmm. of education, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and this is a dire situation I'd say locally because of our choice. What we've seen with choice is even more segregation. Yes. So Tucson Unified, for example, 
used to be 65% white. <coughs> and now we've seen white flight go around to other you know, the suburban schools and the charter schools because of open enrollment and choice. And now it's 65% Latino. Yes. But it's right at 1994 when, when that law passed. So you're absolutely right, being aware of politics, getting out there and educating not just our kids in schools, but families about politics and voting is critical for, for education. So I'll stop there. But I will have my email in case you want to get in touch with me and have questions. I will send it. I'll be